Hello everyone, my name is Jordana Thompson and I'm the program coordinator for Junior Achievement of New Mexico. Thank you so much for attending our virtual career speaker series event. This program is open to JA students across New Mexico and highlights business professionals, entrepreneurs and innovative thinkers from a variety of industries. Each featured speaker will share details about their education, job and career journey. During the speaker's presentation, please make sure that your mics are muted. And if you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and write it down or enter it in our chat box and we will address them during the Q&A portion of our event. Today, we are excited to welcome Angelica Maestas, the Division President of RS21 Health Labs. Angelica, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll go ahead and share my screen and the floor is all yours. All right, sounds good. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you today and share a little bit about my journey to where I got now at RS21. But I'm going to provide some more background information about me before we dive into exactly what I do. Next slide. So just a little bit about me. I grew up in a place called Stockton, California. I love the Chicago Bears. I don't know if we have any football fans here or any Bears fans, but the reason I like to share that little bit about myself, because if anyone follows football, you know that Bears don't often win. And so it's really a testament to my resiliency. I continue to root for them year after year, season after season. And as I say every year, next season is going to be our season. The logo that you see at the bottom in green and blue, that's Versatile Med Analytics, and that's the company that I had co-founded back in 2017. The logo right next to it is now the company and division that I lead after my company was acquired. Next slide. So I really like to emphasize what matters most, and I'll explain why here in just a minute. Um, you can see the photo of my family. So my husband and I are a blended family. We have four kids combined, and their ages are 10, 11, 17, and 22. So we have a pretty hectic home life and, and you know, lots going on every weekend. So um, they're, they're my heart and they are the reason that I'm driven to succeed. I, I love being able to give them new experiences and that photo there, they were in Hawaii. Um, I just, I really love being able to share the benefit of my hard work. Now you'll see my, my puppies here on the screen. There's Winston there in the middle, and we refer to him as our precious baby boy. We don't call him a dog. That would be incredibly offensive to him. Um, and then we have Layla right there. She's our 11-year-old shepherd mix, and she's just a sweetheart. Um, and, and the reason I want to emphasize what matters most is I did spend a lot of my career being a workaholic, which is very easy to kind of fall into. And sometimes that happens when you love your work and you're very passionate about it. And oftentimes that means you work lots and lots of hours, or if you start your own business, you work even more hours. And so my family was very supportive of, of my journey and my passion for work but I did have to learn at one point that there had to be a balance. And so you can never really find a balance in time. You can't always spend an equal amount of time with your friends and family as you do with work, but you can really set aside and emphasize the quality of that time. I, for example, when I'm with my kids on the weekends, I'm disconnecting from work. And when they're having a conversation with me, I'm not checking my email. And, and that took a lot of practice to get into that habit, but it's it's really been a benefit for us all. Next slide. So just a little bit about my, my educational journey. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do professionally. You know, when I started college, it was just something that was, I wanted to do, and that I knew that if I had a college degree, that there would be more opportunities for me, but I had no idea what those opportunities were going to be. So I went to CNM and I completed all my, my prereqs, you know, all of the basic English and math and all of the classes you have to take, no matter which degree program you choose. And then eventually I 
chose my major, which was business. And I did pick a couple of different majors here and there and finally settled on business. And the reason I did that was I had really severe social anxiety as a child and into adulthood. And even as an early adult, I, I couldn't go to the mall by myself. I couldn't go to the grocery store. I just had a lot of anxiety interacting with people. So when it came time for college, I said, well, I'll go to CNM because it's a smaller environment to start with and it was less intimidating and it was really what I needed. So I did that for two years. And then when it came time to pick my major, I said, well, I kind of need to get past and grow from this anxiety. And the only way to do it is to really put myself in a position where I'm gonna be presenting to people and talking with a lot of different people. And so I chose business. And I will say that the very first class presentation I gave was just incredibly painful. Um, I'm surprised I didn't burst into tears. I, you know, was just beat red and sweating and my throat swelled up. But I will say that every single presentation after got a little bit easier. And so I continued on that path until I graduated. Then I went into the workforce and, and we'll talk about what that journey was like. Years later, I decided, you know what? I really loved coding. I wanted to learn open source programming. And I, I'm the type of person that needs a lot of structure. And so I said, okay, well, I'm gonna get an online degree. And so I got my master's of science in analytics from Dakota State University. Next slide. So, you're probably wondering why I have photos here of cats when, you know, my what matters most to me was photos of dogs. <clears throat> so obviously I'm a dog lover. I'm incredibly allergic to cats, but I have found some similarities in my personality and it, you know, pretty, pretty well likened to the personality of a cat. So you think of a cat who, you know, really just likes to be left alone and doing their own thing. And if they want to interact with you, they're going to approach you and then they're going to look for the interaction. So that was very much me and my personality, which was very well suited for someone who was just constantly analyzing data. I was very happy at my desk, just writing code or, you know, driving insights. I was just happy doing that. And um, what happened was I found, oh, well, it's not just something I like doing, like it really lights me up. And so much so that people commented, you know, you're not very expressive, but when you talk about data, you really light up. And so that's clearly a, a passion of yours. Next slide. So that passion for data took me, you know, a couple different places. My first full-time job out of college was for a CPA firm, and they're actually still here in Albuquerque. They go by a different name now, CLA. But I started there as an accounting consultant. And so that's where my finance degree came into play. And I, I took this job because I needed work experience. And when you're fresh out of college, that's all you want is you want someone to hire you. And when they do, you'll just, you know, you'll take it. So I took this job that was really tedious and it was probably my least favorite job throughout my entire career. And keep in mind my first job ever was working at Wendy's, but this job was just particularly tedious. Um, they would send us out to the National Archives in Lenexa, Kansas, which if you're not familiar with is um, the National Archives is, um, underground caves that the government monitors. And we were mining accounting documents from the early 1900s. And these were documents that were involved in, in tribal lawsuits. And so we would be underground and we would be two weeks stints at a time. And I was going through these papers and eventually these papers would be manually entered into a MS access database. And then we would analyze the data. And so, I stayed at that job, not liking it because I needed the, the experience. And I said to myself, well, I'm just gonna do this for two years, two years max, and then I'm moving on to the next thing. Well, then two years went by and I got promoted. And I thought, well, 
it's going to look really good on my resume if I now have this promotion on there. So I'll take the senior position and do this for two more years. And I did that for another two and a half years. And then there were some pretty significant, significant budget cuts that happened. And almost overnight, my office was completely eliminated. And while it can be a very sad and scary thing to lose your job, it was, um, I still actually have the picture of that and I should have included it in this uh, presentation, but it was a picture of me the day that I left my last day on the job and I had my severance packet in hand and I was just grinning ear from, from ear to ear. And it was because I was just ready for my next thing. Um, I, I hope you all get the opportunity to experience that feeling, that gut feeling of just knowing you're ready to move on to the next thing. So that was my experience there. And then I landed, fortunately, at Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that is where I really just fell in love with healthcare data. So I, I took that position, not being qualified for it, and they knew that when they hired me. I only worked with Microsoft Access databases at my old job, so that was my only experience with relational databases. But they said, hey, we use SAS, but that's okay, we'll teach you. We think you're gonna catch on to it pretty quickly. And so I learned a new programming language. And I really just loved writing code. I really loved being able to speak to a machine because that's really what programming is, is you can communicate to your machine in a language that it can understand and it interprets. And so I fell in love with the technical part of that job but then I got exposure to working on programs at Blue Cross where the data helped us better manage our members. So we would you know, use the data to decide how we could better support our diabetic population or how we could better prevent certain, certain groups of people from ending up in the ER. And so for me, it was a way to indirectly have impact and I am a very mission-driven, impact-driven person. And so that just became, um, that became a, a new fire inside of me. So at that point, I, I, you know, got promoted while I was there. I made my journey over to Presbyterian, which is a name you probably all are very familiar with. I still did a lot of the same types of analysis, but I did it um, for what we call delivery in healthcare. And so delivery means, the actual hospital that you go to to receive care or the actual actual doctor you go to to receive care and so that was what we call clinical data that i was able to mine and analyze and work with then my last stop as an employee was at molina healthcare again same type of work i was recruited at a time when they were looking to expand their analytics division and so i said okay i want to be a part of that and so i made my journey over there Next slide. So along my journey, I had lots of lessons learned. I really became frustrated because I knew that healthcare could do better with data, but the systems were so complex internally. The data just lived in all of these different environments and people just didn't have the time or patience to really do what they could with this wealth of data. And so at the time I was at Molina and my best friend was also my manager. And I told her, her name was Stephanie. And I told her, Stephanie, I'm giving you a heads up that I'm kind of tired of this whole, you know, just working for the people that, you know, are, are, are very limited and constrained and really don't even sometimes listen to us when we know what to do with this data. And so I'm just gonna go out on my own and do my own thing. And immediately she was like, what? No, you can't do that, that's crazy. And she tried to talk me out of it for a bit and realized that I was really serious, that I was going to leave and start my own business. And so she said, well, I'm gonna go with you. And so we both resigned from our positions at Molina and we created versatile med analytics. And as we call to now is VMA. So what VMA did was, again, the same types of analysis that we were doing for the people we used to work for, but we were able to do it for 
anyone in the healthcare environment. We could go to Molina or we could go to Presbyterian and Blue Cross and we could work with this broader ecosystem. And to us, that meant working with that broader group of people meant we could have more of an impact. And so that was the genesis for starting VMA. And it was a, a wild, wild ride, which we'll talk about more on this next slide. So one, why did I do it? I did share that I was frustrated because I thought data could use, be used in a more impactful way. I honestly just had this feeling that it was my next thing, much like I had when that first job was completely eliminated. This is what my next feeling was. And people ask me today, well, did you know it was going to be successful? Like you knew, right? Like that's why you took the plunge. You just knew in your heart it was going to be, you know, you were going to succeed. I said, no, you know, absolutely not. It was the most terrifying thing I've, I've ever done. Um, but it was my next chapter. And I remember that feeling intensely. I did not know that it was going to succeed. I just knew that I had to do it. I had to try. And so I did that. And there were a fair amount of people who tried to talk me out of it. My co-founder was one of them, um, but so did my family and my friends. And the reason they did that is that businesses, new businesses have a very high failure rate. And they were, they didn't want to see me fail. And, you know, they didn't want me to be financially impacted. And, um, you know, they, you know, remind me you're an reminded me you're an analyst i mean that's not something analysts do like you're just happy just being off working with your data and so much like i told my co-founder i said no this is something i'm gonna do i've got to do it and so i did and a lot of my former employers from the other side those people became my clients and are still my clients today um and one of the things I like to share about uh, being a business owner is one is you definitely need to have what I call is delusional optimism. You have to believe that you're going to succeed even when past data shows that you likely won't or even when fear tells you you're not going to succeed. You just have to have this belief like, OK, I'm, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to do my best. and Winning doesn't have to be, oh, the business becomes this booming of dollars. Winning can be, I do what was best for me and I grow in some way and I have an impact in some way. And so that was a very valuable lesson learned from that experience. So when I think about my scariest moment as a business owner, uh, it's, it's still a, a moment that gives me a ton of anxiety just thinking about it. So as, as I mentioned, I had essentially I convinced my best friend that she should quit her full time job, knowing that we had no clients in the pipeline and that she should just run off with me and start this business. And she did that because she trusted me, which was, you know, that, that, that's a pretty big vote of confidence for someone to do. So as we were early in the business and not making a ton of money and we did get our first large client, but as we quickly learned, just because you get the client and you get the contract doesn't mean they pay right away. And there are, are lots of reasons for that when you're a vendor and lots of complex processes involved just to get your paycheck. So what happened was our business bank account balance got low and it kept getting lower and you know, money kept flying out to pay the business expenses. And it got to one point where I remember this very vividly. I was sitting on my bed and I was looking at our bank account balance and it was at 52 cents. And my heart just sunk to my stomach. Um, I just, I didn't feel fearful for me. I felt so, that that I had led my friend astray. I thought, oh my God, maybe this was the wrong decision and I shouldn't have done this. Um, and so I had to send her that message and tell her, hey, yet again, we're going to have to take money out of our own pockets and we've got to put it in the account to pay the bills. So she did. 
we did. And um, I will tell you that that experience created a new, it ignited a fire for a new skill that I needed to develop. I had to learn to do business development or otherwise known as sales. And the reason I had to do that is we were not going to get paid if I could not bring in contracts. And so I had to really step out of my comfort zone. I had to learn how to network. I had to approach strangers. I had to I had to convince them that what we were doing provided value and that was not an easy thing. Next slide. So that brings us here to our company being acquired by RS21, which is a data science and development company here in Albuquerque. They acquired us two years ago and we were brought on to form the RS21 Help Lab. Next slide. This beautiful building here in Albuquerque, you might recognize it, though it looks very old on the outside. The our suite inside is, is you know, completely renovated in a really cool space. We've been recognized on the Inc. 500 and voted as the best workplaces for innovators by Fast Company. Next slide. Now, this here shows a little bit about what our team does. So we have data scientists, we have data engineers, we have designers, we have software developers, and we have data analytics. Next slide. This is a little overview of the types of work that we do. Now, my division focuses exclusively on social, social equity and impact. And if, if you go to the next slide, you'll see here what Health Lab's mission is, which is to use data to advance health equity and improve community well-being. And that I mentioned, you know, I'm very mission driven. A big part of that is my backstory and where I grew up. I grew up in a very rough part of Stockton, California. Um, we were often homeless. We stayed in shelters. Um, we slept in our car, motels. It was a very hard life. And that community is the type of community that our company looks to serve. We look to advance health equity. And that means that we recognize that Health isn't just about going to doctor's visits or getting medicine. It means that you have stable housing, that you have a home to go to or the same home to go to every night. It means that you have food. It means that you have access to education. It means that you have transportation to get to school or to get to work. And so that was a big part of my passion and the tools that we build here. Next slide. This is just an, an, an overview of the types of different data sources we, we, um, we use here at RS21. But again, this speaks to all of the factors outside of healthcare that impact the health of communities. We know that it's, um, it's, it's a bigger problem to solve and that we need to be able to harness that data in different ways to do that. Next slide. And so this tool, which we do have a demo link here, but I think we're running up on time. This is the New Mexico Community Insights Explorer that our company is going to be building for New Mexico. It is a, it's a very cool mapping tool, geospatial mapping tool that helps us identify not just where people are and what types of conditions they're suffering from, but we overlay other data like education data, crime data, housing, food data, to be able to understand what other things are impacting those people and why they may not be able to fill their prescriptions. Maybe they're working you know, double nights shifts and they can't get to a pharmacy by five o'clock. Um, maybe they live in very remote areas and they don't have transportation to the grocery store. Um, things like that, that really impact care and ability to receive care. So that's about me and my journey. And now I get to continue to do this at RS21, where I lead the sales of bringing solutions like this to other community partners. And so we are not just here locally, we are across the US, we have clients all over. And that's my joy, bringing them solutions that will impact their communities. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica. That was great. We will mm -hmm. go ahead now and move into the Q&A portion of our event. Uh, I'll start us off with a question just so our students can uh, think a little bit. But uh, for first question, what would you say is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? So that would be at my, my first job after college when we were all let go. My manager had said, never stop investing in yourself. And so I have never stopped. I'm always learning. Um, I, you know, sign up for programs that will e either teach me a new skill or help me to get better in another area. It's really important to never stop growing. And that was something I, 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 I took that lesson every single place I went for my, my, throughout my career. If I got to a point where I felt that I'd learned almost like as much as I could, I said, okay, well, it's time to go to the next thing. Yeah, that was that was my best piece of advice. Thank you. Never stop investing in yourself. I love that. That's great. Do I have any students from either of our attending classes that would like to unmute and ask a question or maybe put your ch uh, question in the chat box and we can ask there? Um, have you ever had like someone scam you on your business or like make give you false information like we'll say that there have been times when people shared information that wasn't quite accurate, but it was just because they didn't know, um, which is not really surprising in healthcare. We have a lot of complexities with the kind of work we do. And so people don't always have access to the types of data that they thought they would have access to. Okay, thank you. What was your favorite part about making a business? Oh, you know what? I loved the complete freedom to own my schedule. And yes, I did work lots of hours, but I loved saying, you know what? I'm kind of tired today and it's 2 p.m. I'm gonna go have coffee with my friend or I'm gonna go spend time with the puppy. I, I love being my own boss. It's the absolute greatest experience ever. Um, what was some of the other degrees you were considering when you were in college? Oh, that's a great question. So I mentioned I changed majors. At one point, well, I'll tell you when I was a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist. I loved bones and dinosaur bones and then quickly realized that, realized that that was a hard job to get to pay the bills. Um, but my first major was... Um, what was it? It would. I, I wanted to go into politics in some capacity, um, so it was political science, and I thought I would be, you know, maybe on city council or, or something like that. And then I recognized that, God bless those people. That's a really frustrating job to have um, because it takes a lot, a lot of work to have to drive change. And so I went through that. Um, I think I chose marketing as a major at one point. And then I settled on finance because I, I did love working with dollars. Um, didn't quite like accounting, but I did like analyzing financial data and seeing if organizations were financially healthy. How many employees do you have? So we have 80-ish employees. It might be a little bit under right now. We are a growing company um, and, and, and we're actively hiring. So. Yeah, we love to hire locally and we love to educate our youth to hopefully explore jobs and data so that they can come work for us someday. All right. Well, thank you so much, Angelica and students. We hope you enjoyed today's program. Before we log off, just a couple of announcements. Following this presentation, you will be asked to complete a post-program mindset survey, and we would really appreciate your participation in evaluating our program. Teachers, please make sure that you share this link to the survey with your students. Lastly, make a note that these events are recurring monthly and will be hosted on the second Wednesday of every month. Please join us next month on March 8th at 1 o'clock 
as we welcome Ian Colburn from Solar Punk Farms. Keep an eye out for those registration links in your email. But thank you so much again to everyone on the call. I hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye.